Hi, it's Brendan here. Before we get into this week's podcast, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who came to my live show with David Starkey earlier this week. He was on absolutely brilliant form. If you missed it, don't worry, you'll get to hear our conversation in the next few weeks. But if you want to make sure you're at our next live event, the best way to do that is by becoming a Spiked supporter. Spike supporters will always get early access to tickets and will always get a discount. There are plenty of other perks that come with being a Spike supporter too. Plus, you get to help out Spike. It is thanks to our supporters that Spike is able to keep going and growing. So, to find out more about becoming a Spike supporter, go to spiked-online.com slash supporters. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. Now, on to this week's episode with Catherine Burblesing. You know, there's hardly enough time to teach the maths and the English and the geography and history that they need to know. So I don't understand where everybody gets all this time to be discussing racism. There's all sorts of problems in this world. What is, is that going to stop you? Are you going to spend your whole life complaining about it? You're going to get to the age of 85 and say, well, I was black, so I couldn't do anything with my life. There's all sorts of things that give you advantages in life. So what? It's ridiculous. You've got one life, right? That's all you got. And you got to go out there and make something of it. And that's what I'm in the business of doing, is inspiring children to take what they've got and make the most of it. Not to sit around nasal gaping and going on about how we're victims and how we can't do anything with our lives. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by returning guest Catherine Burblesing. Catherine is an education reformer and head teacher of the Michaela Community School in Northwest London. She established Michaela, a free school in 2014 and the school has since become widely known for its high expectations of its students, its discipline and its excellent exam results. Catherine regularly speaks and writes on education and other social issues. She is author of To Miss With Love, her diary of working in an inner city school, and she is editor of the book Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers. Catherine is also a CBE and this year she was appointed chair of the Social Mobility Commission. So Catherine, let's talk about education, which is an issue very, very close to your heart. I want to ask you a broad question to begin with, and then hopefully we can dig down in a bit more detail. But it it seems that education in the UK has become an incredibly explosive political issue and almost like a culture war football. So on one side, you've got people saying the problem with education is it's not teaching kids about the true history of Britain with its empire and its slavery. You've got the other side of the debate arguing that the problem is uh, kids not paying enough attention, kids not being taught in a traditional way, kids not having a a kind of a, a traditional approach to education, which is more the side that you come from. What's your overview at the moment of the state of education in the UK? And then through that, I hope we can dig out a few of the specific concerns that you might have. Well, it's always in the same concerns, which is that children need good discipline, uh, we need to have our standards high for them. That means having certain kinds of values where we understand that children need nurturing and molding and we need to say no to them sometimes and we need a system of praise and punishment both at home and at school. We also need to be the authority with them, parents and teachers, where we lead the learning or we lead the moral formation or whatever it is, we're in charge. It's, it's all a bit sad because not enough people take an interest in that. There's unfortunately a whole bunch of kind of lefty crazies, let's call them, (laughs) who campaign against these very sensible ideas that 50 years ago nobody would have questioned. And they feel it's oppressive to children to have them in silence or to give them a detention or to tell them off in any way whatsoever. Um, So they they are on one side. And then sadly... You've got people on the other side who you would hope would consider themselves to be conservative, but um, either they don't take any interest in this sort of thing because they think, well, I'll send my child to private school, so it'll be all right. It's not really of any interest to me, and who cares about disadvantaged kids? It's not my problem. Or 
uh, the ones who get angry about stuff seem to only get angry when it has to do with critical race theory. And they get very annoyed about the idea of critical race theory being taught, but they don't mind if the kids are in total chaos and yeah. like beating each other up, you know? And so they don't understand the connection that the, the loose behavior uh, is all wrapped up in the critical race theory. It's all the same stuff, but uh, people only get mad if it's, if it's critical race theory. Otherwise, all the other stuff that I've been talking about for decades uh, gets ignored. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you about the myopic focus on critical race theory, which is one of the uh, points that people on the right raise all the time. And it seems to be, has become a bit of an obsession and a bit of a, possibly a distraction from the broader issue, as you've just mentioned there. But as a way into that kind of issue, I want to ask you first about something you've raised there, which is the question of discipline and the question of believing that adults should have some authority over children. That, and that goes for parents, obviously, and also for teachers. And as you say, this would not have been considered controversial 40 or 50 years ago, or even less than that. When I was at school, I went to a school that that was attached to a convent. It was run by nuns and um, also lay people as well. Discipline was a central part of our schooling. You were expected to behave yourself, to dress well, to behave yourself on the way home because you had the school uniform on. All of these values were inculcated into us from a very early age, and you you were expected to pay attention to teachers and be quiet in class. Things that were considered very uncontroversial. Now, your school, Michaela, in northwest London, which I visited, and it's a, an amazing school, in my view, it's become famous or possibly even infamous for the fact that it has a disciplinarian regime or a disciplinarian approach to children and it expects high standards of behaviour. Why do you think that proves so controversial now? And why did you think that was an important focus for the school that you're running? Because people reject the idea that adults should be an authority. People confuse uh, being an authority uh, to be uh, being authoritarian. So they sort of think mm. if you are an authority, you are then Hitler um, and you are you hate children. And they don't understand that it's actually <laughs> about loving children. When you love them, then you hold your standards high for them. And you recognize that it's your duty as an adult, whether it's parent or teacher, to hold your standards high. That means that you're not going to let them get away with the worst version of themselves. You're going to insist that they be the better version of themselves. And people have forgotten that children uh, are not born this way. They have to be taught. And so, you know, I use this uh, phrase of original sin recently. And people went insane. I mean, it was just <laughs> insane. I'm never, you know, I'm not even a Christian. All I was saying was Adam and Eve ate the apple. That's how the story goes. And we're flawed. Yes, that's what and we should. 50, 20 years ago, nobody would have thought this was a big deal. Obviously, we're not perfect. Um, I would far prefer to eat chocolate cookies instead of broccoli or to sit on the sofa instead of going on my treadmill. You know why it's hard to do the things that are good for me? Because we are flawed. Man is flawed. That's why with a toddler, he'll hit the other toddler when he wants the toy. I think it's all pretty straightforward. I don't understand what's so controversial, but everybody went mad. And um, they were so angry, and they were so angry with Christians and so on. And, and I was just thinking, it was so weird. I was thinking, well, you know, you know, a whole bunch of people called Christians believe in this stuff, like really do believe in it. I just think, ooh, look, we need to teach kids how to behave themselves. It's really simple, and you do it really easily. You praise them when they do it well, and you tell them off when they don't. And it doesn't mean that you have to be horrible to them. You just say, I'm so disappointed in you. It's really awful. Right, sit on the naughty step for two minutes, and then you'll come off when you're finished. And remember, what do we need to do next time? Well, mummy, I need to make sure that I don't smack my brother in the face. <laughs> oh, that's right. And then they don't do it. I mean, I just don't understand what the big deal is. I, I don't understand it. You know, at school, we give them a 20, 30-minute detention. They sit down, they do some work, they go home. Whoop de doo I don't understand. What is this big deal? <laughs> and then guess what? They behave themselves. It means they're not punching each other. It means they're safe. It means they can sit in a classroom and put their hands up and be excited to answer questions and learn loads and then have the opportunity of making a change in their life so that they can have all doors open to them later and do whatever they want with their lives. What is the problem? I just, you know, I, I just don't, I don't understand. But, you know, you say why? 
because we think that that means we're being mean. Adults want to be friends with their children because it makes them feel nicer about themselves. So you see, it's not actually about loving the children. It's about loving themselves. <laughs> and they refuse to sacrifice for their children. You know, when you have to hold a child to account, you are sacrificing. You are putting their welfare above your own feelings of wanting to feel like a compassionate person, right? That's what you're doing. And few people these days want to sacrifice. And so, you know, I don't know, like, that's where we're at in 2021. <laughs> that's a really good way of putting it. The idea that the adults who refuse to discipline think they're being nice and friendly to the kids, but actually it's more about themselves. It's more about making sure that they don't feel like a bad person and that they can prove that they are a nice, compassionate person and that kind of uh, selfishness in a sense or, or narcissism. But in relation to your school, Michaela, and its discipline, the thing that struck me when I visited is I, you know, I was half expecting to walk into a really miserable school full of sad children looking depressed because they're bossed around all day long. But in fact, it's a school full of very happy children, very confident children. The lunch times are one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in a school. Very well organized lunch times in which kids do little speeches and there's reading out of poetry and it's a very focused event. Also, uh, the kids don't speak in the corridor, they walk in silence, they pay attention in class. And it seems to me to have nurtured a climate, firstly, which is outstanding, according to Ofsted, and it has a very high level of educational attainment, uh, but also one in which the children feel quite happy and comfortable with the teachers who are in a, an authoritative position. And yet it constantly causes controversy. There is always, every now and then, there's a flashpoint of controversy involving Michaela giving detentions to children or whatever else it might be. And also, your, there was lots of people targeting your school when it was being set up and were very reluctant to see it become a reality. So can you just explain a little bit about the hostility you have faced in relation to setting up this school and what you think has been driving that kind of response? Yeah, well, um, it was, it's a free school. It was a conservative idea. There, and I spoke at the Conservative Party conference in 2010. I'm not a conservative. I mean, I'm a small C conservative. I'm not a big C conservative, but that doesn't seem to matter. If you, re if you are at all associated with the Conservative Party, you are therefore evil. So various people, um, yeah, I mean, I'd even get death threats. We, when we were trying to open, there were people protesting outside, calling with banners saying Tory teacher. We tried to, oh, I don't know, you'd have parent evenings, people would infiltrate and they'd stand up and shout over the things I was trying to say to the parents. This is when we were trying to just get people interested in coming to the school. We had to th move three bor three boroughs we moved from in order to try and open because uh, everyone, all our detractors tried to stop us. It took us three and a half years in order to open the school. So we were already massively controversial before we ever opened mm. because um, everyone hated me. And there was a time when I used to genuinely be worried for my life when I would walk home. I'd be looking behind my back to see if anyone was there, you know. So... I mean, nowadays things are different. You know, we've had our outstanding and we've had great results. And so people tend to leave us alone. But it's still the case. Recently, I was made chair of the Social Mobility Commission. And so some people went mad over that, saying how evil I was, etc. I'm, a, or they say I'm extreme right. And I sort of think, well, what? I don't even understand that. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm extreme right because I think children should have good discipline and they should they should be loved and looked after and in a, be in a safe space where they can put their hands up and not be bullied, where they're going to get great GCSEs, disadvantaged kids in the inner city so they can go off and do something with their lives. I just, I, I, I don't come to school. Every morning I meet with my senior team at 7 a.m. I'm in school every single day. I never take a single day off. You know, why do I do that? You know, why am I doing all this stuff? I mean, it's interesting, this, this Social Mobility Commission whatever money that's paid, it goes to the school. So I'm earning no money personally from this whatsoever. So why do I do all of this? You know, that's what I'd like to say to all these people who are supposedly doing these amazing things for the world. You know, why do you think I spend my whole career, my whole life doing all of this stuff? Maybe I, I'm in school every single day and in my senior, with my senior team at 7am because I love children and I like making a difference to their lives. Why would I spend all my time with disadvantaged children? 
Why have I never worked in the private sector? I mean, all of this stuff, it's so ridiculous, but they've got a particular ideology and it doesn't matter how much you try and show them, you know, anybody can come and visit our school. We get 600 visitors a year, mainly teachers who come here and take ideas back to their schools and improve their own classrooms and their own schools as a result. The fact is that, I don't know, these people are, they're mad. And unfortunately, they are, they have lots of power. That's mm -hmm. where I feel really sorry for ordinary families because I think those people are in the minority, but there are a lot of them in teaching. And those families, I, I hear from them on Twitter, you know, they write to me in a panic because they're worried about their children at school and they just don't know what to do. And that, I feel for them. I feel for families because what do you do? You know, then you can kind of homeschool. And there are families that decide to homeschool because they're so worried about what the state is going to provide for them. And I understand it. I understand that worry. We've all been there. We've all started that crash diet. We've all promised ourselves we'll get up early and hit the gym every single day. But we know it just doesn't work. What does work, however, is Noom. Instead of forcing you to make radical changes or adhere to strict targets, Noom helps you understand your mind and body to get the best long-term results. Aim for perfection and you'll get nowhere. Strive for progress with Noom and it will become a reality. You only need to spend 10 minutes a day on Noom to feel the difference. It taught me that it is okay to have off days and there's no such thing as bad food. The Noom app gives you access to loads of different recipes for inspiration, and it also makes it easy and fun to log what food you've eaten and to see your progress. It will help you get healthy without all the stress. Most importantly of all, Noom tailors its programs to your needs, your goals, and your lifestyle. And when you need that extra bit of motivation, their coaching team is on hand for advice and support. Why not sign up for your trial of Noom today? Don't just take it from me. More than 80% of Noom users finish their personalized program and more than 60% end up sticking to their goals for more than a year. Noom's approach is tested and proven to work. So lose the weight for good. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash Brendan. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash Brendan. One of the problems in the state sector education, which you've spoken about and written about a lot over the past two decades, I guess, is the problem of low expectations. And you mentioned their disadvantaged kids. Uh, Michaela has a fairly high number of disadvantaged kids. There's lots of kids from ethnic minority backgrounds. Uh, in this school, they get a very high level of education. They also sing the national anthem. They sing, I vow to thee, my country. There is a sense of community. And I think one of the reasons I guess the education blob or, or what are referred to as liberal teachers, although I don't consider them particularly liberal. I think one of the problems they have with that, as you're suggesting, is that they see those things as an, as an almost an alien imposition on disadvantaged and ethnic minority kids in particular, who surely should be allowed to express themselves in their own way and cleave to their own culture and not have this kind of external expectation of excellent behavior, excellent standard of education. So what to what extent do you think the problem is that particularly when it comes to working class children and children from ethnic minority backgrounds, there is this staggeringly low expectation of what they are capable of achieving. And in some ways that can become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, that's exactly the problem. Um, but I wouldn't say it's just for ethnic minority kids. I'd say it's the white working class as well. I always used to say the white working class were the new black. Um, <laughs> it, it's just this othering. They're, they're the other. And it kind of doesn't matter if it's about race or class or whatever. It's The point is these types of people are not like us. <laughs> and so they cannot do the same things as we do. Our own children, we can expect to behave, but those kinds of children, we cannot expect to behave. So, and they can't possibly learn how to read properly or how to do, you know, how to access Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a good one. You know, well, this stuff is so inaccessible to those kinds of children. So what we need to do is do something that's more relevant to them. So let's read a book about, you know, knife crime in the inner city, and that way they'll be able to relate to it. When the whole point about school is that you're meant to expose them to things they, they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. I mean, that is what you're meant to be doing. Otherwise, <laughs> what's the point of going to school? I mean, if you're already, like, they, they had this whole campaign to teach Stormzy mm. instead of Mozart. 
What the hell is the point of teaching Stormzy when they're all watching Stormzy? Uh, they're, they're listening to Stormzy constantly, whereas they don't know who Mozart is. They've never heard of him. So it's really important, not just Mozart, but Bach and Beethoven and who, all these people. You need to teach them all of those because otherwise they'll never have heard of them. I remember once giving an assembly about, well, I wanted them to know Beethoven's fifth and I played it, da, 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 da. And I played it and I put him up on the screen and he had his wig and everything. And then I was saying how difficult it was for them growing up now because they have, you know, Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and all these people. Whereas when I was growing up in the 1980s, the worst we had was Kylie Minogue in her little shorts. And at the time it was really scandalous that Kylie was in shorts. And anyway, I gave this whole assembly. Later, I was having lunch with them. And I realized then talking to them that they thought that Beethoven and Kylie Minogue were contemporaries. <laughs> <laughs> that was because, I, even with his wig, they hadn't realized. And people don't understand just how little children know, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds. And unless you're teaching them and spending that time with them, if instead you teach them Stormzy because you think that's going to be more interesting, and it's true that in the lesson, they might just find that more fun on a superficial level. But if you don't believe in Beethoven enough to think, well, you know what? Eventually, they're going to be moved by the power of this thing being beautiful. Then they they will never access it. And they will leave school knowing very little. And the problem is that disadvantaged children depend entirely on their school to teach them these things. If you come from a more privileged background, the mom and the dad will take them to the museums and the art galleries and we'll talk about Beethoven across the dinner table and that's fine. If you come from a more disadvantaged family, you won't know any of that stuff unless your school is teaching you. And obviously, if you have great discipline, you have more time in your lessons, the teacher isn't standing at the front asking for silence for 10 minutes before the children sit down and so on. All of this stuff makes a huge difference to social mobility for the children who need it most. And yet, the extreme left, who say they care about these things, like social mobility, are the ones who are preventing social mobility. And all you can do is argue against it. And you do, I do my podcasts, and I do my tweeting, and I show people via the school, and I do this chair in the Social Mobility Commission, I suppose, in order to why am I doing it? Because I think, well, it'll give me a larger platform to be able to talk about these things and give families advice about how not to use mobile phones with their children and not to ruin their reading capacities by giving them loads of screen time and all this sort of thing. I mean, all I can do is keep arguing it, right? That's all you can do. Um, I just wish there were more of us. Mm. I wish there were more mm. of us arguing this. Sometimes I feel like I'm a bit of a lone voice, you know? Just in relation to some of those points you raised there, what do you think are the longer term consequences of an education system which sees Shakespeare as not having enough relevance in kids' lives or Beethoven as being someone far too alien to teach to young children, especially children from disadvantaged backgrounds or, or black kids? You know, what could this old, dead, white European male possibly have to say to black children in Britain in the 21st century. When the teaching establishment or sections of the teaching establishment take that approach, what do you think are the long-term consequences of that? Because surely the whole role of education or a central role of education is to impart the great wisdom and the great achievements and the great culture of the past onto the next generation to kind of bring those things forward make them alive again and pass them on to future generations. And when that's broken, when that no longer happens, and when, we're, when we hear that Stormzy is a better thing to teach or a, an easy-to-read novel is better to teach than a difficult Shakespeare text, what do you think will be the consequences for those kids and for society? Yeah, well, you see, you're saying some very controversial things there because you're essentially saying there's such a thing as the best that's been mm. thought and said. Mm. And that is where the extreme left will take issue with you and say that's not true. Shakespeare isn't any better than a more modern author. I mean, take me, for instance. They say, well, we need to teach more black authors. Well, you know what? I'm a black author. So should we be teaching things I've written uh, over Shakespeare? No, I don't think we should. And you know why? Because I have not been influencing literature for 400 years. <laughs> I don't understand why I have to argue this, but, you know, apparently we do. And that's not to say that you can only teach dead white men, yeah. but you definitely need to be including them because they're a huge part of the, our, our literary canon. You know, it doesn't mean that white men are better. I think that mm -hmm. needs saying. 
I think a lot of people think if you if you really like dead white men, then you think white men are better. But that's not true. It's just that women and black people were doing different things in those days. So, you know, there was like slavery and there was um women were were weren't allowed to write. I mean, they weren't they were wives and, and mothers and I mean look, for goodness sakes, it's not because white men are better, it's just those are the people who were writing at the time. And we need to learn from them. And it means that those of us who write now, who are not male or white or whatever, can all, can then learn from them and be really good writers. Yes. Like, I just, uh, I mean, look, I'm sounding very frustrated, aren't I, at the moment? But um, it is very frustrating. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, uh, it, it should be obvious that to help children. So the Social Mobility Commission, interestingly, last year before I took over as chair, they did this whole analysis and it was out in the newspapers where they said, to rise in the civil service, people need to speak Latin by the water cooler. And I suppose what they were saying was there's a certain cultural literacy, there's a certain understanding of, you know, in terms of education that you need. And when you're at the water cooler, you're talking to people who might be above you, your bosses and so on, you need to be able to connect with them on their kind of level. Well, tell me something I didn't know. <laughs> in any job, <laughs> that um, it is the case that you've got to connect with your bosses somehow. And so people do that by wearing uh, suits and looking smart and turning up on time and also being able to talk about the kinds of things that your boss might find interesting. And so guess what? If it's the case that you need to know a little bit of Latin or you need to know about Shakespeare, my thinking in reading that is, gosh, we need to make sure we teach the kids Latin. We need to make sure we teach kids Shakespeare. But there, some people out there think this is outrageous. That's how the articles were written. This is outrageous. We need to stop people speaking Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they're actually sat there speaking yeah. as Latin, <laughs> the occasional Latin word, you know. And um, the fact is that we cannot eradicate all of these cultural, historical legacies that we've got that are actually quite beautiful in many ways. You know, like the fact is, the fact is, if you've never heard of, I don't know, Leonardo da Vinci, that's a bit sad. Mm. I mean, it makes your life more impoverished, is what I would say. And just like you, but we're saying controversial things there, you see, yeah. because there are some people who would argue that all of those people, you could not know any dead white man and you wouldn't be any worse off for it. But you know what? All of those people arguing it know loads about dead white men. They've all been to private schools and had an excellent education and know all of this stuff. And they go to museums and art galleries all the time. And then they say, my kids shouldn't have access to that stuff. Well, you know what? My kids should have access. And just because they're poor and black and from the inner city does not mean that they should not be able to enter the National Gallery and appreciate what's on those walls just as much as you do. Th that's what those people don't understand. They take their own education for granted. They take their knowledge and their privilege for granted. And then they say that my kids shouldn't have what they've got. And it is infuriating. That brings me on to a, brilliantly to a question I want to ask you about social mobility. So as you've mentioned, you have been made the chair of the Social Mobility Commission, which I think is a very good thing. And uh, I mean, you're being made the chair, whether the Social Mobility Commission does good things, we shall see. But on the question of social mobility, the thing that I find really striking and also frustrating, like you do too, is that a lot of this, the, the new approach to education, the trendy approach to education, the kind of uh, low expectations, although they would never describe them like that, it's often presented in a way of making disadvantaged kids feel more comfortable in their own skin, making them happier, giving them a nicer life. But doesn't this, in the way that you've just hinted at there, doesn't this actually increase the social divide because what you have we know for a fact there is a section of society seven or eight percent who go to private school who get the best education imaginable there's another section of society who go to either a grammar school or a or an excellent state school in a middle class area and it's considered fine that they should get this incredibly high standard of education while at the same time the educational blob is institutionalizing a far poorer form of education for more disadvantaged children on the basis that that's what they can do. And surely that kind of just broadens and broadens the gap between 
the privileged and the underprivileged in educational terms, which then will have a longer term impact on social mobility, on the, on the ability of socially disadvantaged young people to break into those spheres of life. Yes, 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 yes. That's exactly right. The extreme left are the ones uh, preventing disadvantaged children from <laughs> succeeding. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And they go around claiming that they are the compassionate ones mm-hmm. and they are the ones that are helping these children. They're doing exactly the opposite. The same thing applies, actually, when it comes to pandemic, for instance. Everyone went on about how everyone, what, in order to access learning, poor families do not have laptops. And what we need to do is just give out loads of laptops. So the government dutifully went around giving everybody lap, giving all the schools laptops and we all gave the kids laptops. What nobody gives any thought to is that in fact, lots of those poor kids then use those laptops to sit on Snapchat and Instagram, which undermines their learning. But we love, everybody loves this narrative, which is not complex. It's just really straightforward. Poor kids, give them laptops, they get to access their learning. Rich kids, it's bad because they have laptops and they can access their learning. When in actual fact, it's much more complex and that a laptop is not necessarily a good thing. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's more complex. Yes, they might be able to access their Zoom lessons, but they're also accessing other things that are going to prevent them from learning. And that we can all pretend that the Zoom lessons are all fantastic and all the children are listening, but they're not actually doing that. And if they're just black boxes on there and some of the schools had teachers teaching 100 kids at the same time. So, of course, how can you check 100 black boxes? How do you know all the kids are listening? If they're in a disadvantaged home where the parents aren't necessarily on top of them, then they're not actually learning anything. But you know, it's within everybody's interest to pretend that that's all worked. And so we give out laptops, tick that box and everything's okay. You know, that is unfortunately uh, the name of the game in education, which is tick a box, make it look good and move on. And the problem with education is that it takes years to prove something. So like Finland is a great example. For years and years, everybody said, look at wonderful results in Finland. Finland is so progressive. Look at this. And I kept saying, you just wait, just wait. Just wait, it's going to take some years, but we're going to get there. Well, we finally got there, actually. Just now I noticed that um, articles are coming out saying, oh, my goodness, look at the results plummeting in Finland. And I say, it's funny how I predicted that 10 years ago. Funny how I've been saying that for so long. And the reason why the results are failing now is because for years they've been doing a progressive education. And before, when the results were good, let's say six, seven years ago, they were living off the vestiges of the traditional education that they used to have before that. And so the problem is, is that the, the results in education take years to catch up with the new fads and people misunderstand what is working and what isn't working. Also, I also think that in this country, people only take real, a real interest in education when their child is in year six. Suddenly in year six, when they're going to secondary school in year seven, and people are, education is the most important thing in the world, and why don't we have school choice, and why am I not going to get my first choice? And then once their child gets into secondary school, they just forget about it. <laughs> and, and plus, there's a whole section of society that don't care because they're sending the kids to private school anyway. And then there's a bunch of them who are so guilty about their own privilege, they're just happy to send their child to the local state school, and they move into an area where they can get their kids into the state school that they want. And so they keep their friends that way, and they can go to dinner parties and say how great they are. So that's okay. And the kids I teach, their families just don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So, and it just goes on and on. I mean, like, this has been all my life, you know. But, you know, the good news is, the good news is, is that in the last 10 decade or so, I'd say, we have made huge strides, I'd say, in education, especially in this country, more so than in any other country in the West. You know, when I go to New Zealand and Australia and Canada, oh my goodness, they are in such dire straits when it comes to progressivism. We are really fighting it here and we're, 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 we're winning, I feel, in small pockets, but we're winning. And in America, I mean, you know, I, I was saying people only care about critical race theory earlier, but it is a massive yeah. issue, in particular in America. It's so bad in America. I don't see how they're going to come back from where they are. I really don't. It's so bad. And my worry is that it will become just as bad here. And there are pockets of it here and things are changing here. So, you know, if you saw on Channel 4, the uh, program about the school that tried to end racism, mm-hmm. that was it, um, where they split up the white kids and the black kids. And oh my goodness, it was just so dreadful. And they essentially told the white kids they were bad and the black kids they were good and so there's that, but I'm also hearing the way in which people speak in education. It's changed from the way that it was a few years ago. 
So the adult authority thing is interesting. It was always the case that lots of teachers didn't want to be the authority in the class. Whereas now they'll say things. I, some woman I was on a panel with, she said, she said, well, how could I possibly be the authority in the class? I'm a white woman from Northern Ireland. And I thought, so? I mean, who cares? <laughs> you obviously need to be the authority in the class. The, you're the adult. But she feels so uncomfortable about her whiteness that she then wants the black kids leading in the class because somehow she's incapable of doing so because she's white. Please dig deep for Spiked this Christmas. Spiked is completely free and it always will be because we want anyone anywhere to be able to read our content and listen to our podcasts. If you support our pro-freedom, pro-democracy, decidedly anti-woke journalism and you want it to reach as many people as possible, then consider making a Christmas donation today. Anything you can give is greatly appreciated. And if you sign up for a regular donation of £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year, you'll even get a gift in return. You can become a Spiked supporter and enjoy a range of exclusive perks. So donate now by going to spiked-online.com slash donate. That's spiked-online.com slash donate. Okay, so let's talk about that issue in particular, the the race question. And one of the things I've always admired about things I've heard you say or things that you've written is that you have a far more nuanced approach to the question of race and racism than many other commentators. So in the sphere of education, we're told either that it's all racist and kids aren't being taught about the racist past and the education system is racist and the whole bloody country is racist. We're surrounded by racism. But then on the other side, we often hear that there's no racism at all. It's a level playing field now. Black kids have the exact same opportunities as every other kid. And that doesn't quite wash either. So how do you come at this discussion in terms of trying to tease out what are the real problems in relation to racism that still exist and why it's also a problem if we exaggerate them too much? Well, the thing about school is I don't know why we're having this huge discussion. You know, there's <laughs> hardly enough time to teach the maths and the English and the geography and history that they need to know. I'm telling you, we don't have enough time to get through all the content that they need to know for their GCSEs. So, like, I don't understand where everybody gets all this time to be discussing racism. And <laughs> the other thing is, why are we experts on racism? I mean, I consider myself to be quite a good expert on this because I spent a long time thinking about these things and I've read lots of books on this. I really have. I know this stuff. Most people don't. So when black people say to me, hey, children need to be taught about racism in schools, etc., I always say, so you want some 24-year-old white teacher just out of university teaching your children about racism? Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? How is she going to know anything about racism? So that in itself is idiotic. I don't know why we're talking about that. Then there's the sense of, but then there's the other people, as you say, who are saying, oh, there's no such thing as racism. I mean, look, my position with the kids is there are lots of obstacles out there that are going to be in front of you. I'm not here to discuss all these obstacles. I'm here to tell you how to get over those obstacles. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm telling you how to make yourself resilient, how to make yourself ambitious, how to get out, go after your goals, how to be, you know, really good in your lessons so you get the most out of it, so you get the best GCSEs, how to be moral and decent and kind. Those are the things that I'm trying to teach you how to be. Whether or not, I mean, yeah, we could have a debate over racism, so the kids might do that in their debating club and they might talk about any number of different, you know, things that come up in the news and so on. But I don't see it as our role as teachers to either teach them there's loads of racism or there's no racism. Our, our job is to teach maths. And that is actually, it, it speaks to the heart of all of this, which is that, what is school for, you know? And I think some people think school is to create revolutionaries. And some people think it's to teach them m m maths and English. I'm of the school that they should teach, we should teach them maths and English. And you know what? The thing is, is that when you teach them all these subjects and, you know, like, look, like in history, obviously they, they read about revolutionaries and so on. I fully expect some of our children will leave and become revolutionaries and some of them will also become dentists. And that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Like, that's the whole point. There are all kinds of different kids. We had these two police uh, officers in yesterday, actually, two black police officers, deliberately so, who are there saying, hey, look, we're black and we're in the police and we like it and we enjoy our job. Maybe all of you might think about being in the police too. 
And I think that's a great thing. You know, and the reason I think it's a great thing is because there aren't enough black police officers and uh, I'd like there to be more. And so great that our kids should see black uh, police officers in the same way as when I was at Oxford, I used to go and talk at schools to encourage kids in the inner city to think about applying to Oxford and Cambridge because they wouldn't apply kids who look like me. And that doesn't mean that you're giving them any special consideration or anything. You're just showing them, Hey, look, here's a black police officer. And they came and they gave, you know, great talks and the kids found it really fascinating. And then this morning I found out one of our girls had signed up for police cadets and a couple of other kids who'd never thought about joining the police are now thinking about it. And so that's really lovely. You know, that, that's fantastic. And I'm always looking for role models of all different types to come in to inspire the kids and so on. But, but like we didn't talk with the police officers about how much racism mm-hmm. there is. Mm-hmm. Like we just didn't talk about that. And, um, it was interesting because the police officers were saying it's fascinating because the kids aren't asking us that stuff. Yeah. Our kids were asking them things like, why do you put yourselves in the line of danger, you know, for people who you don't know? Why did you decide to study criminology at university? They, and the, the police officer said to me afterwards, isn't it fascinating how these kids, they were asking about, they wanted to see inside us, you know, they wanted to know who we were as people. And the, the questions were actually quite difficult to answer. Whereas, uh, elsewhere, sometimes they feel like they go and the kids are just like saying, oh, you know, how racist is it? How racist is it? I mean, look, there's racism. Fine. Like, there's all sorts of problems in this world. What is, is that going to stop you? You're going to spend your whole life complaining about it? You're going to get to the age of 85 and say, well, I was black, so I couldn't do anything with my life. I mean, what kind of madness is that? <laughs> you've got the cards you've been given. And some of us are tall and some of us are short. Some of us are black. Some of us are white. Some of us are really clever. And some of us not so clever. Some of us are pretty, some of us not so pretty. There's all sorts of things that give you advantages in life. So what? I mean, what on earth? It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, oh, you have got what you've got. You've got one life, right? That's all you got. And you got to go out there and make something of it. And that's what I'm in the business of doing, is inspiring children to take what they've got and make the most of it. Not to sit around nasal gaving and going on about how we're victims and how we can't do anything with our lives. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I hope I don't depress you by just asking you one more question on the racism issue, because I want to ask you about a particular form of racism. Um, I agree with you completely. Of course, racism still exists. It can also become a fatalistic obsession so that young people in particular become so convinced that racism is widespread that it kind of actually holds them back. So there's that problem too. But there's another kind of racism, which is, which you've met, talked about before, which is the And it would never call itself racism, of course, but it's this extraordinary judgment of black conservatives, black people who are also conservative or who take a different view to the woke left or however we refer to them about the nature of Britain, about the nature of education, about the nature of politics. So we saw this with when Tony Sewell's report on ethnic disparities was released. Very interesting report quite a complex report in many ways, acknowledging the existence of disparities, but questioning some of the uh, standard explanations for why they exist. There was an extraordinary backlash against the contributors to that report. Some of it with racial undertones, you know, these people selling their souls to the white establishment, that kind of language. How, How do you understand that? I mean, you get a lot of this flack too from white liberals, liberals in quote marks, how do you understand that kind of racial approach and um, what has been your experience of it? Yeah. So there's a great example of racism at work. So for your listeners who think that racism doesn't exist anymore, here's a wonderful example. This is an example of white people who think that they sort of own black people. <laughs> and when I say own them, what I mean is we have a particular role to play, <laughs> which is to support the left and to be cheerleaders for any, any leftist ideas out there. They don't want us thinking for ourselves. They want us parroting whatever it is they think because we exist to make them feel better about themselves. So it's sort of what I said to you about the kids. Why is it that they don't want to give them detentions and hold them to high standards? Because they want to feel like they're good people and that they're compassionate and decent. So they care more about how they feel about themselves than they do about holding children to high standards and changing those children's lives for the better. Similarly here... They are not interested in black people actually being autonomous human beings who can think for themselves and choose things that they don't choose. We are puppets that are to be used to 
protect a certain view that they've got and a certain lifestyle that they've got. And we need to make them feel good about themselves. So they like feeling like they've come in to save the little black people who are pathetic and cannot help themselves. And so they're going to come in and, you know, you think about sort of white people who go to Africa and then they're amongst the starving Africans and they're like, ooh, look at me. I'm this great white person who's helping these poor black Africans. Same thing here. You know, all these poor black children in the inner city, we're just going to patronize you with some Stormzy instead of teaching you Mozart. And then I feel like a good person and I can sit at my dinner table with my friends and say, look at me. I'm so great. I'm on the left. And people like me, so black conservatives, uh, undermine that position that they hold because they really like being able to look down on us black people. So when we uh, stand up for ourselves and think for ourselves and actually disagree with them, and worse, if we go and set up a school in the inner city and are successful yeah. with it <laughs> with a whole bunch of ethnic minority kids, well, then I am number one, enemy number one, right? <laughs> because I am denying, not only am I arguing with them and disagreeing with them intellectually, I'm then proving that everything that they say is wrong, right? And so they hate me. I mean, they hate me. They tried to do everything they can to shut me up. Uh, and that is racism because they wouldn't treat me like that if I were white. Okay. They wouldn't. And that, that's where I have a much harder time because I'm black and that there is the racism. Now racism appears in all kinds of different ways. That's just one example of it. Okay. We're kind of running out of time. So there's a couple more things I want to ask you about. You mentioned already the lockdown and COVID and the impact that that had on education and in my view, it had a pretty bad impact. And I think one of the things, as you say, it takes a long time to work out exactly what the impacts are in relation to educational achievements and standards and so on. But it seems to me that if you have disadvantaged kids working in a possibly crowded, small home or apartment uh, with not a great deal of equipment, maybe uh, parents who are very, very busy, very stressed out, that form of education done from the home is obviously going to be of a lower standard. The middle class kids or the upper middle class kids who live in big houses have very attentive parents, loads of books, loads of equipment and so on. So what impact do you think the closure of schools over that period of time, it lasted a fairly long time, what impact do you, do you think that will have on exacerbating some of the problematic divisions and trends in education? And do you think it contributed to a culture where there are some families that you've mentioned before who actually prefer their children to stay at home for various family social reasons? Do you think it will exacerbate that problem as well? Huge. Disadvantaged children have been completely decimated by this. I mean, it's awful. Our attendance, for instance, we used to have this such great attendance. We we would because we worked very hard at getting it. And we have all sorts of systems to make it happen. We are in the inner city. We have a very disadvantaged intake. And with COVID, I mean, it's just been completely ruined. I don't think we'll ever get it back to what it used to be. It will never, ever come back to those previous levels. And I'm not just talking about our kids, you know, kids all over the place in any disadvantaged children anywhere. They have so fallen behind. It is so hard. Uh, I don't, and nobody talks about that. So people don't recognize that. They don't, they just, people just close the schools, don't think about it. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happened. Breaks my heart, really, for, for all of these kids. And then all anybody ever says is, oh, what we need is loads of money so we can do catch up clubs and things. You know what? If we were to just fix behavior in all of our schools. You'd be amazed at how much catch up we could do, but they're not willing to do that. All anybody ever says is let's spend more money. And I'm not against more money. You know, if anybody who gave me more money for my school, I'm not going to say no. It's great to have more money. But the fact is the number one reason why we don't make the advances that we could do in education is because of bad ideas. And those bad ideas could just be changed in a moment, just like that. But we got a whole lot of people who are fighting those good ideas. And that's a real shame. Okay. So the final question I have for you is about the future. You said earlier on that there are reasons to be optimistic. There are, you, you feel that there are changes taking place. Some teachers are taking on board some of the kind of ideas that you've been pushing for a long time. But I want to ask you, just to finish, where you think the dynamism for change needs to come from? And you've spoken before about how there is often too much emphasis on the role of the state, for example, pumping more money into schools, giving them more stuff, playing that kind of role in relation as a kind of crutch to education. 
with a neglect to the role of families or more informal networks. And of course, the whole problem of low expectations versus high expectations. So who or what do you think needs to play a more interventionist or a more key role in improving the education system and improving the lot and the aspirations of disadvantaged kids in particular? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. The thing is, is that the state can only do so much. Mm. And I think that people, good and well-meaning people, think that the state can do far more than it actually can do. Simply because without people owning their own development and taking the, you know, the bull by the horns and making things happen for themselves and for their families, the state can only do so much. Now, we do an enormous amount here at school. Not all schools will be able to do as much as we do. Families need to be involved in their children's lives. And I would say that we need a public and a, a state that encourages the family to be more involved in their children's lives. And that's something that we have lost. And I think we've mainly lost it because of our dependence on the state. We imagine that the state can replace the family, and it can't. It can do a lot. I mean, you know, schools are great, and we learn something in schools. But families are just so important, and we have, we've lost that as a society, I'd say, where it just, it, I know even saying it now, the kind of backlash I'll get for saying it, you know? And that doesn't mean, you know, I understand there are all kinds of different families. I'm not saying it even necessarily has to be a mom and a dad, although obviously it's preferable to have two people in the house than just one. But um, the fact is that all children need families who are going to help them develop into better adults. <laughs> and we don't recognize that as, at, in society anymore. In fact, it's considered completely taboo to even say it. And that means we're looking a gift horse in the, in the mouth, you know, that we've got this wonderful resource there that we are denying the, the impact that it can have. And there are lots of families who know it. So those white middle class families, they know mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're not abandoning their children to the state. They're making sure they're taking their children to the extra violin lessons and mm -hmm. to the museums and so on. They're doing the stuff. They just then deny that the family is important. And that is, is so destructive to families who really need to hear from, you know, the wider sphere just how important their role is in, in raising their children. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.